Hey everyone, how are you guys doing today? I want to, to ask um, the anarcho-collectivists a question real quick. To a lot of people who don't know what I mean by, by anarcho-collectivists, it's, uh, I mean those who come from the anarcho-communist, the anarcho-syndicalist camp, uh, maybe even the anarcho-mutualist camp, those who don't believe in private property. I want to ask them a question because obviously, even in their society, they understand, that, or at least they believe that you can have personal property, right? So I can have a house. Private property. Before the takeover of private sewers, the homeowner was responsible for the drainage, right up to the point where it connects into the main sewer. After adoption, the water company that looks after your sewerage services will also be responsible for the section of pipe from the edge of the property boundary to their sewer. Meaning that in this situation, the property owner will remain responsible for only the pipes within their boundary. Properties not connected to public sewers, for example those linked to septic tanks or cesspits, are not affected by this change. I'm junior correspondent Brian Havig here in Lower Manhattan, where protesters are demonstrating against Hurricane Katrina. No. I am here with protesters who are demonstrating against Wall Street, and you can smell freedom in the air. No, that's B.O. That's definitely B.O. I came to Lower Manhattan to get the real story of the Occupy Wall Street movement. I found that it was a strange but wonderful place where freedom roared like an unemployed lion. I just had to learn more. So how long have you guys been here? I've been here 11 days. I don't know, but I was told that Eskimo pussies are rather cold. So basic. I'm chucking it down to uh, where a six-year-old can understand this stuff right now. These nuclear reactors are not going to hold up. That's it. They're not. And you're living in fantasy. Man, if you think they are. Holy moly, something's going on here. So, Tepco lies. Something's going on, definitely. I want to put both cams side by side. Look at this. Just shaking.
There's a reason why ethical behavior is scarce in markets. The key element of what many see as what makes a market necessary is that it provides incentive. Incentive to work, incentive to innovate, incentive to keep the world running. The mechanism by which this incentive is provided is money from either profit or wages for work. I believe the biggest foundational problem of any market system, no matter how free or regulated the market is, is that that, <clears throat> is that, that which is profitable is not always the same as that which is ethical. Good point. If you don't agree with my definition of ethical, then my entire premise falls to pieces and you might as well stop watching right now. Ethics is essentially one system for determining what is right from what is wrong. Right and wrong are thoroughly human constructed values and as such there is no universal physical referent that we can use to determine whether something is right or wrong unless we define the terms in a more useful language, which is what I'm going to do now. Something that is wrong is that which causes pain, suffering, or even simply a decrease in well-being. Something that is right is that which increases well-being and happiness and reduces pain and suffering. Well-being is something we can attach physical reference to. For example, we know that starvation is a form of suffering, so therefore under this new definition domain, it lessens well-being and to cause another person to go hungry would be to cause suffering and would therefore be ethically wrong. Again, if you don't agree, if you think that causing suffering is right and that promoting happiness and health is wrong, then listen no further, turn the video off now. Much of the medical industry today profits from keeping people sick, selling them drugs that mask symptoms rather than helping to achieve real health through proper lifestyle changes, diet, and nutrition. Advertising is unendingly pounded into the minds of children and adults alike, conditioning us to consume product upon useless product with little regard for the environment, which is essentially an act of aggression against every human being on the planet since our lives depend on the ecosystem that this kind of overt materialistic consumption puts into danger. Items are made to break down faster than necessary to increase profit margins. Unproper safety practices in the name of saving money cause oil spills, allow harmful chemicals into our food, cosmetics, cleaning products, etc. All in the name of profit. This is the incentive system of the market system at work. There is money to be made in harming others. However, the biggest and most crushing and fundamental issue created by the market system is inequality. It is absolutely impossible for there to ever be even a veneer of an equal society coexisting with markets. Many say that money is just a medium of exchange, that it can't cause any problems on its own, which is a red herring to say that it's just a medium of exchange, when it is the act of owning and exchanging itself that invariably ends in inequality. Inequality is measurably correlated with suffering across social strata. Not quite. It's not that the more wealthy you get, the more harmful you act. It's that the more inequality there is in a nation or group of people or on a planet, the higher the rates of crime, disease, and social instability are. We are social creatures. We are not moral or amoral solely on the basis of our genes. We know this scientifically. People act as a response to their environment, and the practice of ownership and exchange, dominance and hierarchy, invariably leads to some distrust, dissent, violence, and amorality in a society. I'm not saying that ending market exchange would fix everything either, there are plenty of other factors to consider, but we are never going to have a healthy moral society existing with a market system, it's just not possible. At least without some radical structural changes that somehow make it so that in the market there is not so much radical inequality, and so that harmful but profitable practices are de-incentivized. If everybody had access to a computer whenever they needed one, would anyone steal computers? If anyone had access to food whenever they needed it, would anybody steal food? If anybody had access to abundant energy, would there be wars for energy resources? Of course not. The way to alleviate most crime and social problems is by creating a society that meets people's needs. Not just food, shelter, and water, but social needs, entertainment, personal fulfillment as well. Do people who are loved, fed, fulfilled, inspired, and aspiring act in antisocial ways? They do not. Any prison psychiatrist can confirm this for you. Criminals are a result of circumstance. Almost every single rapist and murderer was physically abused as a child, and the rest felt deprived in other ways, emotionally or psychologically. Building a toy train that lasts four years at 75% of the material resource cost of building a train that would last 50 years is empirically wasteful. 
yet empirically more profitable. That is a fact. And having a market incentivizes production of the former over the latter. Many mistakenly believe that competition within markets will eventually lead to that toy train that lasts 50 years being built. But competition does not really work that way. Company A will build a train that lasts the four years, and the mechanism of competition will incentivize Company B to make a train that lasts five years. Then Company A may make theirs last five years and put a shinier engine on it. And then Company B retorts with a return to four years, but faster speeds and a new aerodynamic design. Then Company A makes it last four and a half years with even faster speeds, multiple color options, and a new sleeker, smaller engine. All the while, we could have had trains four times as fast and ten times as durable. Competition does not incentivize efficiency at all, but rather a small portion of variability around the least efficient possible. True, the current inequality is due to a sort of Frankenstein monster of capitalism we have today called neoliberalism or corporatism. So no, a truly free market is not to blame for today's inequality. But nobody has yet shown me a viable mechanism by which inequality could ever hope to be circumvented in a truly free market. If you can demonstrate for me somehow that everyone in a free market would have access to the same level of goods and services as everybody else, I will gladly rethink my stance. Also, we must remember that interference in a free market isn't incentivized by a free market because interfering in a market for your own benefit will bring you more benefit. Of course not. Listen back to everything I said. I'm promoting equality. Does making you work and then taking the fruits of that labor away from you and giving it to others sound very equal? Does it sound ethical by my definition of promoting happiness and reducing harm? It does not. I would never give anyone else claim over the fruits of your labor. This is a gross misunderstanding of my perspective. Robotics today are highly advanced. Most, if not all, production could be accomplished with completely minimal human participation and oversight. The point is to make the products of labor so abundant that to hoard them would be foolish. Design a system where literally a few labor hours per month from anyone who wishes to volunteer, no, nothing required, would provide all goods for all people. In this system, people in this current system or in a free market system, people must be employed or the system will fail because the people can't buy anything. If this it is this need to keep people employed that prevents us from utilizing automation to its fullest extent and limits production. And I wouldn't want to. I was speaking before of harm and aggression. While well, forcing anyone to do anything in most cases would certainly be both. The only obligation I expect from others is to not interfere with those who wish to create a system that provides for all who desire food, shelter, education, entertainment, etc. If you choose not to participate or not to accept the benefit of such society, I wouldn't dream of telling you that you must. But here's the clincher. Free markets do force participation and at the figurative gunpoint of starvation. Participation is forced, and once participating, all negative behaviors previously talked about are incentivized. By running a society on the basis of markets and profit, we invariably cause some of the people in that society to act unethically, to interfere with the well-being of others, and often themselves. Thank you.
Hello, I'm John Cleese, and today I'm here to address a very serious issue, an issue with the potential to affect us all. Subliminal advertising. A very subversive technique which uses images flash before our eyes that last only a split second, but just long enough... This is the new Schweppes, the lemon fusion. to ask um, the anarcho-collectivists a question real quick. To a lot of people who don't know what I mean by, by anarcho-collectivists, it's, uh, I mean those who come from the anarcho-communist, the anarcho-syndicalist camp, uh, maybe even the anarcho-mutualist camp, those who don't believe in private property. I want to ask them a question because obviously, even in their society, they understand, that, or at least they believe, that you can have personal property, right? So I can have a house... Private property is fundamental to our freedom. Our government should protect our private property, not take our private property. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon famously quipped, La propriété c'est le vol, property is theft. I won't say that that's mistranslated, but I believe that it's misunderstood in the modern world, and especially in the modern English-speaking world. Um, what he would have been referring to in the 19th century when he wrote was what we would now today called rentier property, absentee, uh, absentee landlordism or absentee possession. In other words, um, whoever owns the property doesn't have to do anything uh, but sit around, smoke cigars, drink champagne, and be a lounge lizard and draw dividends. And the people who actually do the work get very little in return. It's not, he wasn't trying to say that if you own a small cottage, you are a thief. He, this was actually a denunciation of rentier property, of uh, dividend-based property. That's all. That's just my opinion, my take on what I know of Monsieur Proudhon and his works. Um, I would actually modernize that uh, in terms of the modern sort of libertarian discourse, shall we say, or anarcho-capitalist or randist objectivist discourse, I would say the following, based on my uh, interpretation of the discourse that holds that taxation is theft, I would define taxation as a demand made by the group upon the individual. I would define property as a demand made by the individual on the group. And taking those two uh, definitions as my starting point, which I, I don't expect everyone to agree with, by the way. I understand that a lot of people are going to disagree, um, but that's, I suppose, the purpose of this, uh, of this post, this video. Um, taking the uh, point of view that um, taxation is a demand of the group placed on the individual and property is a demand of the individual placed on the group, I would then say if taxation is theft, then property is theft. Note that I've got the if-then in there. Um, one side of that equation doesn't really work in my view of things without the other. If taxation is theft, then property is theft. Thank you. Thank you.
yeah. and I was wondering if you have an opinion on the fact that, for example, some people say that nobody is controlling this digital revolution, that you know, there's an epistemological change in our young people's minds, or is that rather more of a capitalistic control no, no, by I'm guys? I'm very classical Marxist here. I think that digital revolution is obviously more and more a, a field of battle. Mm -hmm. And extremely important things are happening there. For example, this new reorganization in clouds, you know, like computers mm -hmm. getting Cloud smaller and smaller. You just have a phone, but you rely on a cloud. Where? This is the perversion that Marx could have imagined. You have cloud, which stands for general intellect, public reason, but it's privatized. For example, let's take a news which was so sad for me. You know that iTunes, all the Apple Imperium, iPod and so on, they made a deal with Murdoch to provide exclusively news for them. All right. This is I didn't know. That's yes, it's, yes. Interesting, so interesting. this ruins all your illusions. So it's only because I it. had that bad Bill Gates, but Steve Jobs is some bad. No, no, no. Even of private property rights be expanded as far as possible while minimizing the role of public property.
thank you very much for listening to these videos and I hope you enjoy the next one with me and Akio Matsumura, a former Japanese ambassador to the United Nations. Thanks for watching Fairwinds. Well, Annie, thank you very much for inviting me to such a wonderful place. This is my first time visit to Vermont. And also I'd like to thank you and Maggie for making a great contribution to increase public awareness of the risk of at Fukushima. Uh, many readers my blog appreciated what you have done. Well, th thank you, Akiela. Coming from you, that means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to Maggie, too. Um, you know, we, we, we try our best, and uh, I'm glad that the world wants to hear it. Well, I have received many questions uh, from my readers. Does TEPCO have the capacity to handle these magnitudes of disasters or not? I do not know. But... I also heard from inside the story in Japan that TEPCO executive also believe that TEPCO alone cannot handle this magnitude of disasters. Also, I wrote a letter to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon urging him to establish independent international assessment team composed of the nuclear scientist, geologist, engineering structure, because we are laymen confused by so many scientists saying all the different stories. And I mentioned to former Prime Minister Hatoyama, I only believe in what Annie said, what Helen uh, Katikot said. So, Annie, what do you think of this uh, first question is, my suggestion is to establish internationally independent assessment team to look at totality of picture of the problem we face now at the Fukushima. I think it's a great idea. I think we definitely need an international team of really independent experts to go in and outline um, a logical plan to um, uh, to minimize the exposure to the Japanese people moving forward. The IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, um, claims to be that independent agency because it's an arm of the UN. But if you look at the charter, article number two of their charter is to promote nuclear power. Now, to my way of thinking, that means you're not independent. The, the team of individuals has to be respected by the people of Japan who are going to have to, one, live with the radiation, and two, have to clean up after this. Um, and so to rely on a group who's trying to promote nuclear power seems to me to be uh, counterproductive. So an international team of experts going in and laying out a plan going forward um, to be implemented by somebody other than Tokyo Electric, I think, is critical. The, the other piece of that is that if the... Um, uh, if that plan is put in place and a, and a large engineering firm is put in to replace Tokyo Electric, the independent team should remain as an overseer of the, uh, of the large international um, engineering organization because the trust of the people in Japan can't be on a company that uh, also builds nuclear power plants. It would have to be on that independent expert team. That independent expert team could also put pressure on the nation of Japan's government to spend the money that's needed to solve this problem. I think what we have right now is that the uh, Japanese government isn't willing to give Tokyo Electric any more money, and Tokyo Electric then is trying to um, decontaminate the, the, the site on a, uh, on a budget that's not big enough. So if they're... If that international team could put pressure on the contractor to do the job right and also represent to the people of Japan the true cost of the cleanup, I think that would solve the two biggest problems facing the Daiichi site. In the first part of this video, we really tried to propose an alternative to the situation that's actually happening in Japan today. 
you know, if you read the papers or, or the different blogs that are out there, the, um, the, you can always find another problem at Fukushima Daiichi. Rats eating the wires, radiation leaking into the ocean. And what Fairwinds has been trying to do for two years now is to say that there are alternatives. There are alternatives to fixing up the Fukushima Daiichi site, and there are alternatives to nuclear power in the future. So the second half of this, this video talks about the problems on the site and the potential ramifications for the world moving forward. Please help us with a donation or translation expertise or twittering this to um, other people so that the message gets out there. Uh, Fairwinds needs your help so we can make sure that that one bad day isn't in your backyard. Well, uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, I mentioned to political leaders, uh, I went to Japan twice last year. I'm saying this is a national crisis. And a national crisis cannot depend on TEPCO or private sectors. This is really serious crisis, catastrophe, not only for Japan, the rest of the world. So that number one. Now, since the accident, you also uh, warning of danger of reactor number four, which we understand is a huge contaminated water uh, spent fuel poor. Now, you also recently raised the issue, concern about reactor number three. Would you kindly explain to me what is more your new concern of reactor number three compared to reactor number four? The condition of the site right now is, is precarious. Um, as long as there's no earthquake, um, it'll be okay. But that's, that, that's a big if, you know, where you're sort of counting on um, uh, an earthquake not occurring in a country that's prone to, uh, to earthquakes. And by a, a, an earthquake, I'm talking about a Richter 7 uh, at or near the site. Now, uh, there's, there's three problems with the site right now. The first is the enormous amount of water that's stored on the site in, in hundreds of tanks. Tokyo Electric isn't letting us know exactly what the radioactive material is in those sites, but there's so much radiation in those tanks, we do know that the exposure to people who are outside of the plant boundary is very, very high. Now, that tells us there's this phenomenon called Bremsstrahlung, and, and the decay of radioactive material in those tanks is releasing x-rays uh, in, in very high quantities off-site. That means that those tanks are extraordinarily radioactive, and if there is an earthquake, none of them are seismically qualified. So we could easily have a situation where 700 tanks spring leaks, it runs across the surface of the site and into the Pacific Ocean. That's more contamination in those tanks than has already been released into the Pacific Ocean. So number one is an earthquake destroying the tanks and causing them to leak. Number two is my uh, uh, the, the concern I've had for years, which is the structural condition of Unit 4. Unit 4's fuel pool has the most fuel and the hottest fuel. Uh, it was recently changed out. So a loss of cooling in the Unit 4 fuel pool can still lead to a fuel pool fire and contamination of vast amounts of the country. The chance of a fuel pool fire diminishes with time because the fuel becomes cooler. It's not there yet, but it is approaching the point where if the pool were to lose water, it's likely that the fuel would not catch on fire. That assumes the fuel stays intact. If the earthquake is significant enough to distort the fuel and cause it to collapse, uh, all bets are off, and um, you can still get heating to the point of creating a fire um, if the fuel were to break and, and not be cooled. But the third thing, Akio, is what you referred to as the uh, Unit 3 problem. Unit 3 has less fuel in it than Unit 4. That's good. The bad news, though, is that Unit 3 is much more severely damaged than Unit 4. So 
If Unit 4 could ride out a Richter 7 earthquake, it's likely Unit 3 will not. So the, um, the, the risk of a structural uh, failure at Unit 3 is higher, although there's somewhat less nuclear fuel in the fuel pool, um, it still presents, in my mind now, uh, rapidly becoming the single biggest risk on the site is a structural failure of the Unit 3 building because of all the damage from the uh, massive detonation shockwave that hit the building. The, the magnitude of this problem is, is, is huge. It's as if we, the Japanese should be fighting this as if it were a war. And you don't fight a war on a budget. And I think that's what's happening in, in uh, Fukushima. Um, Tokyo Electric has minimal funds, and they're doing the best they can with minimal funds. And the Japanese government, uh, it's easier for them to blame the problems on Tokyo Electric rather than face the fact that at the root of this problem is that there's not enough money being spent. So if you're going to uh, solve the biggest industrial accident in history, you're going to need the funds required to do that. And I don't think either party, Tokyo Electric or the Japanese government. They'll be calling you radical. There's been an earthquake right underneath the Fukushima plant. And everybody's going psycho crazy, and they should be. Now, it's 13 miles under. Let's talk about this. Let's, so, I was, so I was asked yesterday by two different people in two separate interviews about China syndrome, what I felt like was going to happen. Look, let's, China syndrome is very real. This going on, we're talking, what, 920 days over there? The trinium levels in TEPCO's own trenches over the last 90 days have told the tale up 10 times, up 100 times, up another 10 times, as Einstein himself worked on this theory as far as the most powerful concept in others is compounding. It wasn't about finance. Compounding is about exactly this, fission. It's going on. Now, I was asked yesterday how I thought it would play out because nothing's been done. If you think China syndrome nuclear fission isn't real, you are as naive as they get. And if you believe any word that come from Habe and these lying pieces of shit IEA by now, the World Health Organization, the mass nuclear media, if you're believing anything, we are the media, period. Their credibility is completely gone, completely gone. So don't be posting the bullshit there. I mean, my accuracy and our small army's accuracy, we're, we've told the tale in detail. We're the media, period. Now. What I believe will happen, as far as because people have hypothesized, that's the word China Center will burn all the way through the earth. What's well, going to continue to freak? And those, these are gamma alpha rays that have unforeseen in the history of mankind. This has never happened before. So we have to rely on science. And what we know as far as science, then the trinium levels are proving it over and over in TEPCO's own trenches. So is it going to spew these giant creatures up in the air? Maybe. But I believe this is exactly what happened just now, is what's going to happen. I think more and more of it's going to happen. And I think you're going to start to see eruptions and ruptures through the seawall into the Pacific. And how scary is this? <laughs> Can you believe not? I mean, here's number four sitting there. And people say, oh, they, they went dry. Yeah, they did go dry. And a lot of that, and I, I cannot overemphasize this. I cannot overemphasize this. It is safer to live in Tokyo, Japan, than San Francisco, California, Portland, Maine, New York City, New York, Lansing, Michigan, Dallas, Texas, Los Angeles, California, Vancouver, Canada, Toronto, Montreal, Glasgow, Scotland, London, England, Ireland, over and over and over. The wind was blowing out when the plume went over us, and the plume was heavy, very heavy. Radnet did not work. We know what the numbers were. They were gigantic, and cancer is spiking here. This is a big story. This is directly underneath, 13 miles under. Do I believe that it's the gamma rays have made it 13 miles down? Oh, yeah, absolutely, easily. I mean, I remember TEPCO's trenches in the early days. I think about day seven. A large number of highly radioactive isotopes released by the destruction of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant grossly contaminated the Japanese mainland. Most of these radionuclides had short half-lives, which meant they would essentially disappear in a matter of days or months. For many of those who were exposed to them, there will be major health consequences.
However, there are some radioactive elements that will not rapidly disappear, and it is these long-lived radionuclides that will remain to negatively affect the health of all complex life forms that are exposed to them. Chief among them is cesium-137, which has taken on special significance because it's proven to be the most abundant of the long-lived radionuclides that has remained in the environment following the nuclear disasters at Chernobyl and Fukushima. It has a 30-year radioactive half-life, which is why it persists in the environment. Scientists now believe that it will be 180 to 320 years before the cesium-137 around the destroyed Chernobyl reactor actually disappears from the environment. Cesium is water-soluble and quickly makes its way into soils and waters. It's the same atomic family as potassium, and it mimics it, acting as a macronutrient. It quickly becomes ubiquitous in contaminated ecosystems. It is distributed by the catastrophic accidents of nuclear power plants because large quantities of volatile radioactive cesium build up inside the fuel rods of nuclear reactors. Thus, any accident in a nuclear reactor that causes the fuel rods to rupture, melt, or burn will cause the release of radioactive cesium gas. Long-lived radionuclides, such as cesium-137, are something new to us as a species. They did not exist on Earth in any appreciable quantities during the entire evolution of complex life. Although they are invisible to our senses, they are millions of times more poisonous than most of the common poisons we are familiar with. They cause cancer, leukemia, genetic mutations, birth defects, malformations, and abortions at concentrations almost below human recognition and comprehension. They are lethal at the atomic or molecular level. They emit radiation, invisible forms of matter and energy that we might compare to fire, because radiation burns and destroys human tissue. But unlike the fire of fossil fuels, the nuclear fire that issues forth from radioactive elements cannot be extinguished. It is not a fire that can be scattered or suffocated because it burns at the atomic level. It comes from the disintegration of single atoms. Thus, radioactivity is a term which indicates how many radioactive atoms are disintegrating in a time period. We measure the intensity of radioactivity by the rate of disintegrations and the energy they produce. One becquerel is equal to one atomic disintegration per second. One curie is defined as that amount of any radioactive material that will decay at a rate of 37 billion disintegrations per second. Stempel je danes vreden tem nekje okrog 200 tisoč evrov. Me se pravi, tukaj nastopijo znameniti problemi med vrednostjo in ceno. Nekaj stane tolk, je v obrašanje, koliko je vredno.
Experimentálna matúra. Rádia, štúdia.